Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Yeah, I love it, Joe. I love it. I'm excited to be here, excited to do it. So, Yeah, it. we're going to have some fun today, for sure. So, uh, so tell us a little bit. Uh, so, man, as a as a general for for those of the for for those of the audience that haven't seen your episode, um, man, you sell pet stuff and and mainly some really cool pet stuff and some chicken coops. And um, tell us a little bit about uh, your company and then your experience on on Shark Tank. Yeah, Joe. Um, so, Innovation Pet is the name of the company. And as I said to you in the past, if you haven't watched the episode, could you please go watch it? Because they're not going to put this body on TV too many more times in my life. <laughs> so definitely please go watch it because that'll be one of the only times I'm on TV. Um, it was season seven, we, um, right? Se season seven. Season seven. Yeah. Season seven, episode 21. Yep. Um, and we, um, we started the company back in 2012. Um, and, you know, we started with one idea for a cat toy. We're working with a children's toy company. They produce children's toys. And I've spent my career in the pet industry, calling on Petco and PetSmart and Target and Walmart and um, selling them pet products. I worked for a, a really big player in the pet industry when I started. So I've been doing this for, you know, 20 years. Well, I always dreamed of doing my own company. So I found a partner and we... Um, we started a company partnering with this children's toy company where we designed, um, we, it was a cat play system. We called it the Kitty Connection. Mm -hmm. And it was really well done. The partners we worked with um, were amazing at designing children's toys and they knocked it out of the park with this cat um, system that we developed. And we won a ton of industry awards at trade shows, major trade shows. There's one in Orlando called Global. We won the best product of the show. Wow, um, that's great. And then we, there was one, yeah. I mean, Joe, it was, um, you know, for two people, you know, trying to design products, it was, you know, it was we grabbed some attention pretty quick. And, but that product was so specialized. Um, we had, it was so specialized. It did okay. We got it in Petco and they started selling it. We got it on some online retailers out there and it did well. Um, but our first year in business in 2013, we did about um, $300,000 in sales. Um, then somebody asked us, one of the customers, I'm going to tell you, I think it was Petco, it could have been PetSmart, um, asked us if we'd make a wooden doghouse for them. And um, that's when we um, we made a wooden doghouse, and it, it was kind of a whimsical design. It was on the show as well. And it grabbed some attention because it was a fun design. All the dog houses on the market were boxy and really kind of plain. This had a little fashion to it. And so it grabbed some attention. Well, we started working with a wood manufacturer to make that. And then we quickly, um, we pivoted and started manufacturing chicken coops, um, which, you know, back in, you know, when we started the company back in 2012, um, there was a couple of egg recalls out there, and you started to see this climb in what the USDA tracks as backyard flocks. Okay. Um, people who raise six to eight chickens in their backyard. Um, and so we, it, because we're making wooden dog houses, we started making these wooden chicken coops, and we initially sold them online, and it quickly started to grow. And um, then in, you know, then we pretty much, by the when we were on Shark Tank, we were still selling the Kitty Connection, and we filmed in 2015. By the time we aired in 2016, um, we were pretty much a chicken coop only company. Interesting, because they just started ramping up so quickly. Um, I probably went too far, but so no, no, this is this is great. Making, yeah, we started making uh, cat toys. Then we went into a doghouse, and then boom, we started this chicken craze, and that pretty much became the company um, all the way up until when we sold it uh, last year. So, uh, so on the show, uh, you got some some love from Damon, who had who who has chickens, which is crazy to me. I I, I don't think of you know I, we partner with Lori Grenier, and, and I still don't you know I talk to her a lot, and and but I still don't think of her as like human if if that makes sense like so so me thinking of Damon raising chickens is a is a little uh, little out there um but uh but yeah. but yeah so i mean if you have somebody like him that's raising again in in our neighborhood i know there's at least 3 or 4 people that have these small flocks which is uh, yeah it was funny we did not know 
that he had chickens. But we <laughs> did go into the tank gover- going for him. We wow. went in and said, if Damon <clears throat> offers us a deal. And, Joe, in, in, there's two major pet shows in the industry. And Damon has been extremely active in the pet industry. In fact, he came and he spoke at uh, Super Zoo's, the show in Vegas in July, and he came and spoke there. And okay. about 3,000 people in the industry came. He sits on, Petco has a charity board, and Damon sits on there. So we went in knowing that we're in this pet field, mm-hmm. um, and we definitely focused on him. And you were in, you know, you've been on Shark Tank. Those guys are all ego people, and they <laughs> think their questions need to be answered first. They were, they were asking questions before the, the they would ask another question before I answered the first question. And so I sometimes that would frustrate them if you're not paying attention to them and you're paying it. But we knew if Damon uh, a- asked a question, we were answering his question right away and focusing in on him just because we felt like if he made us an offer, we had to take him. Right. Because he's in the industry, he's known out there, a lot of customers know him, and he's done some good for the industry as well. Um, so, you know, we kind of keyed in on him before we walked in the door and it's funny we had an offer from kevin which probably made more financial sense but it, because those two sit next to each other we were answering most of their questions a lot and gotcha. then um you know not that we ignored other people but we dig on well we're focused on that yeah i did uh it, it's interesting that you said that because I, as i watched your episode Again, financially, you look at it, you're like, Mr. Wonderful's deal was better than than Damon's. Yeah. It, it really was. Um, j- again, just from the financial side. But that, but that doesn't mean that that's the right partner, though. Um, which again that's is right. is something that, if you're just watching the show, maybe you don't get that sometimes. You know, if you haven't been in there and had that, um, you, you know, had that those conversations before going on there, where you're like, this person is who we want to go after. We 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 were going after Lori Grenier. That was that was someone who we thought would help us. Um, the yeah. deal was less important than the person that we that, that the person that we would partner with. Uh, at least that was our our opinion. So it sounds like that was the same as as you and your partner. Same. Joe, we went we went in. We knew Damon was so active with our accounts, and we knew we would benefit if we got him. Um, and it's funny, later on, we found out he had chickens. And he <laughs> he said that in there, and I was like, no, he doesn't have chickens. And he actually has um, something called guinea hens, which are, I mean, they're a unique uh, species of chickens. Um, they're very loud. Um, I wouldn't recommend having guinea hens. But okay. Damon lives on a big farm, and you can have louder birds. But I definitely wouldn't recommend guinea hens for your backyard, um, just because they're very vocal birds and um, but definitely fun birds to have. But when he said that, he said in there, we had bought, I bought a couple of chicken coops. I, I, I kind of let it roll off because none of the research I did on any of them told me that anybody had um, chickens. But he did. And he, um, he, we ended up sending a couple of coops up to him. And Damon, Damon was awesome. You're right. Financially, Kevin, um, and Ke- Kevin really was, um, you know, he comes across as, um, you know, uh, uh, but uh, I'd say he comes across like, I don't want to use a bad word. I was going to say but kind of the bad comes guy across as a Yeah. The, the tough guy on the there, guy. the guy who yep. makes people cry, but he actually was very, his questions in there were very financially forward. Mm-hmm. I mean, for, you know, we were an import company. He picked up on that right away, asked about our cash flow issues and stuff like that, because import, when you're importing products from other countries, you have such a lag time by the time you pay for it to the time your customer pays for it. And he was digging into that. And it, it, so it, I was more impressed that, you know, and you know this, Joe, you're in there for such a long time and they show eight minutes of airtime. I think right. eight and a half minutes is what they show of you. And by the way, remember that for, I think we were in there 90 minutes in front of them, an hour and a half, and they showed eight minutes. Remember, I, I was rocket brilliant for um, about an hour and 20 minutes. But the eight minutes they showed, you know, is where they showed where I look like a donkey. So remember that there is a brilliant side of Tim. Um, but the eight minutes, they definitely like showing when you get tripped up or you stumble or whatever. So, it makes good TV. Um, that's that, that's it what it does. is. It does. It yep, does. I, I always told my friends. I told my friends that um, they want to see you laugh or cry on there. Um, you know, something to make them laugh or something to make them cry. And they put that on. So. 
Um, you know, one thing I, I failed to mention to you, it, it's funny, the reach of that show. We sold a, um, we sell customers. I have, I sell chicken coops to a major customer in France. Mm -hmm. It's a company called Botanique. Um, it's strange over in France. Pet stores and flower stores are always hooked together. So Botanique, Botany, <clears throat> they're a flower shop and they, um, and they sell our chicken coops. But we sell in France, we sell in England, Costco, we sell in England, but we sell this group out of Finland. They're kind of the PetSmart or Petco of Scandinavia. They get about 300 stores in Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and they're based in Finland. And um, my buyer there, I have a merchandise manager that I work with there, and my buyer emailed me one time. We were going back and forth on the email, and she's like, hey, I saw you on Shark Tank last night. And I'm like, I didn't know that they were <laughs> running episodes of Shark Tank and other, I asked her, I go, I didn't know I speak Finnish. I, you know, I thought I only spoke <laughs> English, but I said, how's my Finnish? And she said, no, they play it in English. But it, it amazed me just because it did, you know, buyers overseas started seeing. And Joe, you know this, the history of the show uh, started, it was called Dragon's Lair. And mm -hmm. it started overseas, and then it came to the States. So they have their own version over there. I didn't think they were showing the American version as reruns over there, but they did. I, I, it was just one of the funnier times that I'm like, geez, somebody in Finland saw me on Shark Tank. So it definitely, the reach that our customers saw definitely um, expanded more than I just thought it was in, in the States. I did too, and <clears throat> and I had the similar experience. I had uh, some, uh, you know, people from Australia, some from Asia, um, definitely the the UK uh, reach out, and uh, the, again through the through the years, and and same thing. You know, hey, I saw you on on Shark Tank, whether it was a rerun or, or whatever the case may be, and we're like really they show that over there, like oh no, you know, US TV shows are really popular everywhere else in the world, I guess. So and especially Shark Tank, yeah. it's it's kind of a universal. You know, uh, across the world, small businesses getting some some limelight and pitching. That's kind of universal across the across the world. It's interesting to yeah. everybody. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. So you grew fast. So so from from the time you were on on Shark Tank at uh, well, you said but maybe around two million dollars, right? And then. Um, you know, uh, 2020, you guys were, you, you sold the company, but you were doing about 20 million in, in sales. So you, you, you grew really, really fast. Um, man, how did it feel to scale up that fast? I, I'm sure there were some, yeah. pa some pain involved, huh? It, it's funny, Joe. It, I have a, a, we had a partner in a company and he's a brilliant guy. Um, he, he just an amazing guy and he taught me more lessons than anything. <clears throat> Um, he, he taught me more lessons about business and, and just, he's just such a good, humble business leader. Um, and him and I sold a company back in 2017 at the same time I was running a separate company, um, with him as, as well as doing innovation pet. But he said, and he was an investor in innovation pet. And he said, you know, sometimes you're a healthier company being smaller. You know, and, and the young guy in me always says, gee, I want to be bigger, grow more, sell more. But he's like, you know, sometimes it's healthier to be a $5 million company than a $20 million company. And, and, and there's many truths to that because you can manage more effectively at $5 million. You can take the time. When you're moving rocket fast with three of us running a company, at twenty million dollars, you're not making the smart decisions. You know, you're not sitting back. You don't. You don't have time to shop for the best freight rate. You're just booking freight. You know, right. instead of being smart about getting your freight costs down or your production costs, we were just buying. You know, as fast as we could produce, we were shipping it. So when you're a five million dollar company, and that was his point, and um, it's something that hindsight, when you step back and look at it, I understand his point now, and. Um, so, yeah, when we the, talking about the growth, when we started the company in 2012, we didn't sell anything that year. We were mostly designing products. 2013, we had about 300,000. 2014, we were about two million, about a million and a half. Then when we aired, and I'm probably skipping a year in there, but 2015 is when we aired in June, or when we filmed. Sorry, yep. Joe. Um, when we filmed in June of 2015, we were a two million dollar company. We actually finished. We said two million dollars on the episode, but we finished the year at two point five million. 
Um, but because of the way our business ran, we knew in 2016 we were going to be a much bigger company. And we tripled sales that next year, not because of Shark Tank, because we had to book all those orders early. We pretty much book them in November, December, you know, right. November, December. We're booking orders for that following season. So we knew we were going to be triple. So it was funny. One of the things that kind of surfaced is we were a $2 million company when we filmed. But by the time we aired, we were a $6 million company. So the deal that we made in the tank didn't make sense anymore just because we had tripled the company. And we were a $2 million yep. company cutting a deal. Well, now we were a $6 million company. And when we aired in June of, or it, it was uh, when we aired in March, I think it was March 2016. It might have been April, but March or April in that time frame. We knew we were becoming much bigger than that for the next year. Um, and we went from $6 million to $16 million that next year. We had another $10 million on top of it. So definitely the deal we made a year and a half earlier when we filmed didn't make sense anymore. Um, and that was one of our challenges with Damon. And Damon, I will tell you, has been we picked Damon. I might be um, we picked Damon when we were in the tank. We made a deal with him, and he, he was nothing but amazing. I mean, helping us out. He he mentioned us. He was doing an interview in GQ GQ magazine, and he mentioned us in there as being one of his favorite companies. <laughs> GQ. And that's I a, always that's told awesome. my buddies, I go. I never thought I'd be in GQ, but <laughs> apparently I made GQ. So, um, but yeah, he he was nothing but but it was tough because the company grew so quick and that deal we made with them didn't make sense. And he acknowledged that too. He's like, it just doesn't make sense because you guys grew so quick and, and you know, everyone needs help, mm -hmm. but we knew what we were doing. And so, you know, financially we were financed well, we, you know, so it, it, he couldn't find a way that he could come in and say, okay, here's where I can help you guys. Um, so we really struggled there to really kind of put together a deal with Damon, but he was unbelievable for us. Came to a couple of trade shows, worked the trade shows with us. So he's, he was a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, the, um, <clears throat> again, one of the things, if, 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 uh, you know, if you're kind of new to the shark tank community, uh, you know, for those of you that are listening, you know, a lot of the deals, um, that are struck on the show, either, don't finish or they change, you know, even our deal changed, you know, mainly because we had a, uh, you know, a new retail partner that had kind of stepped in where Lori was going to be. And so we just changed our deal with Lori and, and, and made it make sense for us where we were at that time to, again, to your point, you know, business changes very, very quickly. So, you know, sometimes, yeah, uh, it definitely did. Yep. It, it definitely did Joe, especially for us. And that's why, you know, everyone's like, oh, so you didn't, but it just, the company continues to transform. And then when you do air, we weren't a big online company. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in fact, that was one of the things Damon was negotiating and they really dug in because a lot of companies go in there and, you know, they're a big online company. We were a major retail company. We were selling Petco, we were selling Tractor Supply, Walmart, those kind of customers mm -hmm. where we didn't sell a lot of online. In fact, our Amazon sales when we even, you know, all the way till the end, we definitely started improving our sales online. But the, again, shipping a big chicken coop that weighs 200 pounds is very tough to do online. Yep. But at the end, out of 16 million, we were probably doing $2 million online. When we were in the tank, um, and we were a $2 million company. We were doing literally, I think, $15,000 online. And that that really grabbed a lot of their attention because, you know, a lot of their companies really focus on promoting online. We weren't doing that. We were selling through retail outlets. And so I think they all saw a lot of growth potential there. And we kind of shucked away from that a little bit. But Damon definitely keyed in on that and said, I can help you on the, the online world. But, you know, really, once he started digging into the company and logistics, I think he realized, along with us, that's tough area to really focus the company on because it is such a heavy commodity driven product. So, um, but yeah, go back and say this, um, you know, Damon was awesome for us. It just was tough to make a deal with them because of the growth of the company. And that deal looked totally different by the time we aired. 
So, so let's talk about your, your, uh, your growth and some of the things that you've had to change. Again, one of the things that, uh, again, as somebody who is either an aspiring business leader or you know, wants, wants to start their company or they have a small company, one of the things that uh, I've learned is you know, change is the only thing that I can count on. <laughs> it's the, I, I know that, that my business is going to look dramatically different in a year and two years than it does today. Um, and then I'm going to have to make pivots and, and I'm going to have to, you know, you know, take some good guesses through, you know, through the information that I have today, um, especially, you know, right now as we're filming this, you know, we're the, the uh, COVID thing is kind of wrapping up a little bit, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, but man, have did some companies have to make some pivots during that. But, but you, your business made some dramatic ones. I mean, you, you went on, you know, talking about cat toys, which was a big thing for you, and and your shift changes changed uh, totally, right? I mean, yeah, right. Joe. It was. Um, it, it's funny that you mentioned that. One of our big customers um, was a pet store chain called Pet Sense, um, <clears throat> and it was started by a man who was the original founder of PetSmart, and um, it was a really cool company, and they had this concept. Um, and I share this, I'll get there quickly, but um, it was a, it's a, it was a retail chain and they said, okay, well, PetSmart and Petco's are everywhere. So what we'll do is we'll go into outlet malls and open up pet stores there. And so they opened up 25 of these outlet mall um, pet stores mm -hmm. and, and they started failing miserably because people didn't want to go to an outlet mall to buy their pet food and they pivoted quickly. And they said, okay, that's not working. But that was the business model. But they would have been out of business if they didn't pivot quickly. And I love that story because it was run by a group of guys, an amazing group of industry veterans out there. And they pivoted and they started going to smaller towns where Petco and PetSmart was not. Hmm. And it became rocket successful. And they sold the company to Tractor Supply, who currently owns it. And in the, you know, the man who was running the company at the time said, if we didn't pivot, and he said exactly what you did. He said, good companies pivot, and they turn well. And he's like, companies that just don't aren't willing to turn and take a new avenue, they, they'll go out of business. They'll fall. Our, our challenge is, um, golly, I mean, it was one after another. But when you say that, that we're not unique in that. There'll be more challenges coming forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, we definitely dealt with the Trump tariffs. You know, yep. Donald Trump came in, put a ton. We were manufacturing in China and put 30%. We went from 3% tariffs to 30% tariffs on our products. Well, we had to dramatically shift quickly because that same chicken coop that we were selling for $200 all of a sudden was $299. It was another $100. So we quickly had to shift and move our production out of China, and we moved it down to Mexico um, just because of NAFTA and being able to... Mm -hmm. and, and that was a, just a huge, huge undertaking to move manufacturing. And we had trusted we had trusted partners that we had been working with for 20 years. I've worked with these manufacturing teams over in China and just an amazing group that we work with over there. Um, but to pull that production out of there after 20 years and move it to a new production team was a challenge well beyond what we thought it was going to be. Um, you know, it, it, that definitely affected, that drove a lot of us. But again, we had to pivot just to, it, just to keep our growth going and to keep you know, kind of the momentum going. We knew that raising the retails that dramatically would slow down the volume and slow down kind of the consumer growth that we saw in the category. But yeah, and I mentioned this to you before, Joe, that um, you know, when we were a two million dollar company, it, it was it, we should have done. It was easier then, you know. When you're it's a smaller company, you can make um, decisions, and you know you can you have time to shop the freight bills and find the best freight rate. You have time to put structures in place that when you're 16 million, you don't have time for it because you're just moving at the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, hindsight, if we had to do something, we would have absolutely put more structure in place when we were a smaller company. It didn't seem to matter, but we would put more structure in place 
when we were two million, when we were 16 million, we didn't have time to look at that structure. We just had to deliver chicken coops out there. So, um, yeah, I mentioned that before to you, but it, 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 when you're small, it's the time to put those disciplines in place that will affect you when you're growing because you will grow. Great companies grow. And when you're growing, you don't have time to put those disciplines in place. Absolutely. We have a, a, we're going through something now where one of our main administrators um, who, you know, we just kind of threw everything at her. You know what I mean? It was like she became the system for, for a lot of, of, of one of our manufacturing plants. And um, <clears throat> to your point, as we're growing, you know, you don't, you don't think about the system. You're like, just make her, she'll take care of it. She'll take care of it. She'll take care of it. Now, you know, she, you know, she's moving on to, to another opportunity. And we're like, oh my goodness, like we don't have, we never set up systems here. We never like, we never did the things that we were important for us to grow here. Um, and now it's, it's, I don't want to say it's too late. Of course it's not too late. We're going to, you know, we, we have to go in and, and, but man, how much better would it have been, you know, three years, five, four years ago, if we would have set up systems for then a person or whatever becomes kind of interchangeable. It's like, no, no, we just, we just put, you know, this person leaves and we just put this person in and, uh, man, that's a, that's a huge lesson that is. And right it's one that's, that we're dealing with right now. I mean, it's, it's painful for us. And, uh, again, yeah. if you want to, if you want a lesson from a tank, that's, that's a good one. You know, get your systems in place early, get them in when you're young and create that, uh, create that organization, that team that can be 20 million, 50 million, a hundred million. So we had the exact same thing, Joe. Uh, and it's funny you mentioned that. It was another, we had, um, we had amazing, you know, there were two partners in the company originally, but then, um, we we had that we knew we needed good people you know right. good companies are made up of good people and we went and got one of the greatest people that um, we both had worked with in the past her name's Andrea Farber and she's amazing amazing but exactly like you said she was the brain behind the basically the logistics of the company mm -hmm. and she knew it and did it and was amazing at it but if she were to go away we were in a lot of trouble because she knew every system and how to get it there and how to correct issues and how to and what customers needed what kind of paperwork and how to label pallets for certain customers and she was the brains behind it all and it, it, again it was funny when we sold the company that one of the major one of the things that the new company wanted was her mm -hmm. and they ended up hiring her because um she was the brains behind the organization and we should have had, if you asked me what she did, I knew what she did, but I couldn't step in and do it. And that was a danger. And we talked about that. You know, we need that job. If Andrea goes away, decides that, and she, God knows, good people tend to move up. And we were always afraid of losing her because she was the brains behind the company. And that, you know, right or wrong, she's just so valuable. But you should have the disciplines and the functions in place that you can change that position. It's exactly what you said, Joe, that you should have those positions ready so that when you're $20 million, there's a flow to it, there's a structure in place. But again, hindsight, when you're two million, you got time, you know, we were having company meetings, you know, we, we had time and it just didn't seem as vital to say, okay, we need a structure in place on, you know, on our order entry times and our lead times, you know, we, we flux them around. When we were 20 million, that became rocket important, and we were struggling to put those disciplines in place. Yeah, it's 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 amazing as you grow, where um, you know <clears throat> we have a uh, you know urgent and important. You know, we we kind of try to categorize things like that. You know, um, and yeah. it, you know as you grow, urgent becomes more of your day to day. Unfortunately, instead of the important, you know, the important of, of, you know, getting the good systems in place and, and ha having the right people and, and all of those types of things. Um, it very, very quickly turns to, wow, now things are need happen need to happen right now. And you just don't have the, the time to, to yeah. even though the important things are by definition, more important, um, they're just, they're just not, they're not at the forefront of, of your mind. Um, and, and if you can ignore it for another day, you're like, whoo, okay, I, I, I was able to ignore it for one more day. But it yeah, becomes well, very difficult to know, become a... Things. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, Joe. No, go ahead. Yeah, well, well I was going to say, it becomes very difficult to, 
to uh, run a you know run a hundred million dollar company or a fifty million dollar company, um, you know, doing things the same way you did them at at two million, unless you prepared well, unless you're you're okay. unless you have that vision in mind that I'm going to be a hundred million dollar company, so therefore I need to do these things right now. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, again, Joe. Yeah, I mean, you said it perfectly. You know, there's small things that just don't matter when you're two million but they matter when you're 50 million, you know, and it's small things like, you know, we only have one eyes on the money when we were $2 million, we should have had more eyes on the books, watching every penny where it's going, where it was being spent. Because when you got $16 million flowing through the bank account, it becomes a lot more complex. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, small things that we looked at in you know, hindsight that we should, oh yeah, we should have more eyes on the books and more eyes on the money, you know, but when it was 2 million, not as important because it's a little bit, you know, it's a little slower at that time. But when 16 million's flying through the bank account, you you really need to be watching where the pennies are going. So and there are just a lot of lessons on growing that quick. And again, well, one of my mentors, um, you know, always said, you know, sometimes you're a healthier company being a smaller company. And, you know, being the young, good looking guy, I always want to grow real fast. I wanted to be a $50 million company, but you know, he said, you know, a five million dollar profitable company is better than being a twenty million dollar unprofitable company. And so he said, in, in what he was really preaching is, you can grow, but make sure you're making the right decisions as you grow, instead of just you know going for that next five million dollars and then going for that next five million dollars. Make sure that you're healthy every step of the way. And uh, you know, a hindsight lesson, definitely. Yeah, and that's one one of the things too. You know, for us as Shark Tank companies, you know, you fifty million dollar companies don't go in front of the the sharks and, and pitch. You know, we're we're all small businesses that go and do that. Um, and then we are forced to grow mainly because of the notoriety that that happens. Um, I mean, it just it just yep. does. Uh, you know, the, the, yep. that that limelight that that hits us um, makes us grow and. Um, Man, I, I mean, even so, some things as silly as you know, making sure that websites are are kept up and things like that. You know, how, how many how, how many people have you have you seen where they they the show airs and their freaking website shuts down? You know, and it, and it's like, oh my goodness, yeah. like, and and we think, oh, that's such a that that's such an easy thing as we look back and go, make sure you're prepared for that. But how can you? Like, it, you know, you you really yeah. have to have purpose to do that. Yeah, Joe, one of the, that's a great point, too. God, as you talk, I'm like, oh, yeah, we had that problem, too. Um, you know, one of the things when you're a small company, you don't know about doing some, like, we had some videos on there, some pretty cool videos, but we didn't have licensed music on there. We just had some music that we put together. You mm -hmm. know, my son put together a video and would put some of his favorite music on there. Well, we didn't have the license for that. So yeah, it's okay when no one's coming to your website, but when people start coming to your website in droves after shark tank that's not okay you need to right. make sure your music's licensed and that so we had to go back and re-edit these videos and just small stuff like that that where we were doing things as a small company that when you start getting noticed quickly you have to change and yeah one you know website was when well, damon one of the things he helped us out with early on was our website design we weren't a big web company and he came in with his group and just overhauled it, changed the platform on it so it could hold more volume. And we still never, um, it was interesting. Yeah, I, I, we're, you know, I know so many people who've been on the, um, I've been on the show now and just because we reach out to each other and a lot of companies that on Shark Tank have a lot of success with, you know, just the, the initial push of consumers coming to their webpage after them being on the show. That really never happened with us. I think our spike, you know, was around 15,000 people came to our site after the show, you know, and then when we rerun, we get about six to 8,000. But we never saw this mammoth, you know, 10 million people hitting our site, or, you know, even 500,000. It was always in the tens of thousands. And, um, we, you know, I know companies, again, chicken coops, you know, there's only 7 million households in the U.S. that participate in this backyard flock so we're only hitting a narrow part of the audience out there right so i know a lot of companies out there um who've been on shark tank just do really well online 
Um, and really, you know, that, that the notoriety being on the show really helped spark them. Never really happened with us. What did happen, though, Joe, is it, the notoriety came from our retail partners because mm -hmm. that was sexy to them. You know, Petco um, gave us a lot of attention. Pet Smart, uh, you know, Tractor Supply, those kind of retail partners. That was sexy to them that we were out there getting this publicity platform. And so it definitely helped us get attention, you know, for being a small company, we were daggone well noticed at Tractor Supply. In fact, in 2019, you know, Tractor Supply does $8 billion in sales a year. We were selling them chicken coops and, um, you know, one little small vendor, and we won vendor of the year there just because of, the, and, and not because of being on Shark Tank, but we had so much attention there, and we focused so much on them innovation-wise and stuff. So the publicity platform that we got with Shark Tank, we just used in a different way. Um, and, you know, it was frustrating to us because we thought, okay, here comes millions of dollars in sales online, but we used it in another way. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, it does. So, wow, I'll tell you what, we, uh, we're uh, out of time here, but uh, I, I think you and I could probably talk for another two hours. Um, and so we, maybe we'll have to do this again, do a, do a part two, because I, I know – um, you know, this has been really valuable talking about, you know, getting set up for future success. Um, you know, that, yeah. that's a huge lesson, huge, huge, huge lesson. Yeah. It, so for those of you that are listening, um, do the right things now where you're at, whether you're, you know, still in your garage trying to invent something or just starting a business or, or you're growing, um, you know, do, do the right things at whatever stage you're at now to make sure that you're prepared for, for future growth, that's all. That's what we want to do. You know, as business, uh, yeah. there's not many business leaders that that are going. You know what? I'd really like to. To your point, sometimes it's healthier to be small, but not a lot of business leaders go. You know what? I, I want to shrink this company from ten million down to five million. You know, it's it's. Um, so, yeah, so but sometimes that's the healthy move. Joe, it is, and you know yeah. that. And you know, quickly, Joe, before we end, um, I think it's amazing what you're doing, um, taking the platform that you've been given and giving back, truly giving back um, by trying to teach the lessons that we all learned. I wish you would have been doing this podcast before I went on Shark Tank or before I went into business, not even um, much more than, um, but I think it's amazing. And on behalf of everyone who's been in our Shark Tank group and small businesses, I appreciate what you're doing. I think it's amazing. I, I, I honestly, I mean, first of all, I, I thank all the entrepreneurs that take their time out to to do this with me. And uh, I, to, to your point, uh, there's so many things that I have learned, um, and, and even from our group, just since since group joining the the Shark Tank entrepreneurs that that are now a tight knit tribe of, of people. Yeah. That uh, I, to, to exactly what you said, I wish I had some of these lessons early on because I would have done things differently. So if we can, if we right. can help, you know, together, if we can help some other people not step on the landmines that we did, man, that's, it's, it's worth the, the, the half hour, 40 minutes that, that we, we, we talk. So, but yeah, how, how can, uh, so, so you're, you're onto some new ventures. Um, any, um, any way of, of getting a hold of you, any, any, uh, anything that you, um, can share with us uh, about what, what the future holds for, for, for you personally? Yeah, I, 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 we, I, I started um, a company. We kind of went a little bit broader. We're still working with some manufacturing teams. If you go to um, um, mybackyardfarm.com, and it's my backyard farm. So we kind of, take, you know, we were doing chicken coops, but we're kind of broadening that out now because what we learned was um, it, that, you know, if people who are raising backyard chickens, they want to raise their own herbs. And so, you know, they want to grow their own vegetables. And so typically that lifestyle, when you want those fresh eggs from your chicken, kind of grow beyond just raising chickens. It's a lifestyle choice. And, and people who are, you know, we, we, we're in the cities, we're raising our kids or whatever, but you still want that kind of backyard farm experience. So, yeah, we're, we kind of broaden the reach now where we're doing planters and we're doing um, rabbit homes and just really broadening it for you know, somebody to make it easy for them to create their own backyard farm. So if you get a chance to look at, um, it's mybackyardfarm.com. That's a and, great um, URL, by the way. The, that's catchy. That. I like that. I, I like, I, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a web and marketing guy. Um, that one's, yeah. that's a good one. I, I like that a lot, a lot. Mybackyardfarm.com. So. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's a group I'm partners with, um, 
oh, four, three women in that. And um, it's it's an amazing group um, and just design. We're having a lot of fun with it. So um, start in making the smart decisions early on as we grow. So yeah, taking the lessons that we learn. But yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Good for you. Well, thank you so much for, for being part of the podcast and, and thanks for all of your advice. And, and uh, I can't wait until we uh, we do this again like i said i definitely think there should be a part two to this so thanks so much love it joe i appreciate it thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of lessons from the tank if you got value from today's podcast we encourage you to subscribe to the podcast so you're notified when a new episode is posted if you'd like to support our podcast we encourage you to review it and share it with a friend thank you and we'll see you on the next episode